Trust by Jack London. All lines had been cast off, and the Seattle number no. four was pulling slowly out from the shore. Her decks were piled high with freight and baggage, and swarmed with a heterogeneous company of Indians, dogs and dog mushers, prospectors, traders, and homeward bound gold seekers. A goodly portion of Dawson was lined up on the bank, saying goodbye. As the gangplank came in and the steamer nosed into the stream, the clamor of farewell became deafening. Also, in that eleventh moment, everybody began to remember final farewell messages and to shout them back and forth across the widening stretch of water. Louis Bondel, curling his yellow mustache with one hand and languidly waving the other hand to his friends on shore, suddenly remembered something and sprang to the rail. Oh, Fred, he bawled. Oh, Fred! The Fred, desired, thrust a strapping pair of shoulders through the forefront of the crowd on the bank and tried to catch Louis Bondel's message. The latter grew red in the face with vain vociferation. Still, the water widened between steamboat and shore. Hey, you, Captain Scott, he yelled at the pilot house. Stop the boat! The gongs clanged, and the big stern wheel reversed, then stopped. All hands on steamboat and on bank took advantage of this respite to exchange final, new, and imperative farewells. More futile than ever was Louis Bondel's efforts to make himself heard. The Seattle number no. 4 lost way and drifted downstream, and Captain Scott had to go ahead and reverse a second time. His head disappeared inside the pilot house, coming into view a moment later behind a big megaphone. Now, Captain Scott had a remarkable voice, and the shut up he launched at the crowd on deck and on shore should have been heard at the top of Moosehide Mountain and as far as Klondike City. This official remonstrance from the pilot house spread a film of silence over the tumult. Now, what do you want to say? Captain Scott demanded. Tell Fred Churchill, he's on the bank there, tell him to go to McDonald. It's in his safe, a small grip sack of mine. Tell him to get it and bring it out when he comes. In the silence, Captain Scott bellowed the message ashore through the megaphone. You, Fred Churchill, go to McDonald in his safe, small grip sack, belongs to Louis Bondell. Important. Bring it out when you come. Got it? Churchill waved his hand in token that he had got it. In truth, had MacDonald half a mile away opened his window, he'd have got it too. The tumult of farewell rose again, and the gongs clanged, and the Seattle number no. 4 went ahead, swung out into the stream, turned on her heel, and headed down the Yukon, Bondell and Churchill waving farewell and mutual affection to the last. That was in midsummer. In the fall of the year, the W.H. Willis started up the Yukon with 200 homeward-bound pilgrims on board. Among them was Churchill. In his stateroom, in the middle of a clothes bag, was Louis Bondell's grip. It was a small, stout, leather affair, and its weight of 40 pounds made Churchill nervous when he wandered too far from it. The man in the adjoining stateroom had a treasure of gold dust, hidden similarly in a clothes bag, and the pair of them ultimately arranged to stand watch. While one went down to eat, the other kept an eye on the two stateroom doors. When Churchill wanted to take a hand at whist, the other man mounted guard, and when the other man wanted to relax his soul, Churchill read four months old newspapers on a camp stool between the two doors. There were signs of an early winter, and the question that was discussed from dawn till dark and far into the dark, was whether they would get out before the freeze-up or be compelled to abandon the steamboat and tramp out over the ice. There were irritating delays. Twice, the engines broke down and had to be tinkered up, and each time there were snow flurries to warn them of the imminence of winter. 
Nine times the W.H. Willis essayed to ascend the Five Finger Rapids with her impaired machinery, and when she succeeded, she was four days behind her very liberal schedule. The question that then arose was whether or not the steamboat Flora would wait for her above the Box Canyon. The stretch of water between the head of the Box Canyon and the foot of the White Horse Rapids was unnavigable for steamboats, and passengers were transshipped at that point, walking around the rapids from one steamboat to the other. There were no telephones in the country, hence no way of informing the waiting Flora that the Willis was four days late, but coming. When the W.H. Willis pulled into White Horse, it was learned that the Flora had waited three days over the limit and had departed only a few hours before. Also, it was learned that she would tie up at Tagish Point till 9 o'clock Sunday morning. It was then 4 o'clock Saturday afternoon. The Pilgrims called a meeting. On board was a large Peterborough canoe, consigned to the police post at the head of Lake Bennett. They agreed to be responsible for it and to deliver it. Next, they called for volunteers. Two men were needed to make a race for the flora. A score of men volunteered on the instant. Among them was Churchill, such being his nature that he volunteered before he thought of Bondell's grip sack. When this thought came to him, he began to hope that he would not be selected. But a man who had made a name as captain of a college football eleven, as a president of an athletic club, as a dog musher and a stampeder in the Yukon, and moreover who possessed such shoulders as he, had no right to avoid the honor. It was thrust upon him and upon the gigantic German, Nick Antonson. While a crowd of the pilgrims, the canoe on their shoulders, started on a trot over the portage, Churchill ran to his stateroom. He turned the contents of the clothes bag on the floor and caught up the grip with the intention of entrusting it to the man next door. Then the thought smote him that he had no right to let it out of his possession. So he dashed ashore with it and ran up the portage, changing it often from one hand to the other and wondering if it really did not weigh more than 40 pounds. It was half past four in the afternoon when the two men started. The current of the 30 mile river was so strong that rarely could they use their paddles. It was out on one bank with a tow line over the shoulders, stumbling over the rocks, forcing a way through the underbrush, slipping at times and falling into the water, wading often up to the knees and waist. And then, when an insurmountable bluff was encountered, it was into the canoe, out paddles, and a wild and losing dash across the current to the other bank, in paddles, over the side, and out tow line again. It was exhausting work. Antonson toiled like the giant he was, uncomplaining, persistent, but driven to his utmost by the powerful body and indomitable brain of Churchill. They never paused for rest. It was go, go, and keep on going. A crisp wind blew down the river, freezing their hands and making it imperative from time to time to beat the blood back into the numbed fingers. As night came on, they were compelled to trust to luck. They fell repeatedly on the untraveled banks, and tore their clothing to shreds in the underbrush they could not see. Both men were badly scratched and bleeding. A dozen times in their wild dashes from bank to bank, they struck snags and were capsized. The first time this happened, Churchill dived and groped in three feet of water for the grip sack. He lost half an hour in recovering it, and after that it was carried securely lashed to the canoe. As long as the canoe floated, it was safe. Antonson jeered at the grip, and toward morning began to curse it. But Churchill vouchsafed no explanations. Their delays and mischances were endless. On one swift bend around which poured a healthy young rapid, they lost two hours, making a score of attempts and capsizing twice. At this point, on both banks were precipitous bluffs, rising out of deep water and along which they could neither tow nor pole, while they could not gain with the paddles against the current. At each attempt, they strained to the utmost with the paddles, and each time, with heads nigh to bursting from the effort, they were played out and swept back. They succeeded, finally, by accident. 
In the swiftest current, near the end of another failure, a freak of the current sheared the canoe out of Churchill's control and flung it against the bluff. Churchill made a blind leap at the bluff and landed in a crevice. Holding on with one hand, he held the swamped canoe with the other till Antonson dragged himself out of the water. Then they pulled the canoe out and rested. A fresh start at this crucial point took them by. They landed on the bank above and plunged themselves immediately ashore and into the brush with the tow line. Daylight found them far below Tagish Post. At nine o'clock Sunday morning, they could hear the flora whistling her departure. And when at ten o'clock they dragged themselves into the post, they could barely see the flora's smoke far to the southward. It was a pair of worn-out tattered demalions that Captain Jones of the Mounted Police welcomed and fed, and he afterward averred that they possessed two of the most tremendous appetites he had ever observed. They lay down and slept in their wet rags by the stove. At the end of two hours, Churchill got up, carried Bondell's grip, which he had used for a pillow, down to the canoe, kicked Antonson awake, and started in pursuit of the floor. There's no telling what might happen, machinery breakdown or something, was his reply to Captain Jones's expostulations. I'm going to catch that steamer and send her back for the boys. Tagish Lake was white with a fall gale that blew in their teeth. Big swinging seas rushed upon the canoe, compelling one man to bail and leaving one man to paddle. Headway could not be made. They ran along the shallow shore and went overboard, one man ahead on the tow line, the other shoving on the canoe. They fought the gale up to their waist in the icy water, often up to their necks, often over their heads, and buried by the big crested waves. There was no rest, never a moment's pause from the cheerless, heartbreaking battle. That night, at the head of Tagish Lake, in the thick of a driving snow squall, they overhauled the flora. Antonson fell on board, lay where he had fallen, and snored. Churchill looked like a wild man, his clothes barely clung to him. His face was iced up and swollen from the protracted effort of 24 hours, while his hands were so swollen that he could not close the fingers. As for his feet, it was an agony to stand upon them. The captain of the floor was loath to go back to White Horse. Churchill was persistent and imperative. The captain was stubborn. He pointed out finally that nothing was to be gained by going back because the only ocean steamer at Dai, the Athenian, was to sail on Tuesday morning, and that he could not make the back trip to Whitehorse and bring up the stranded pilgrims in time to make the connection. What time does the Athenian sail? Churchill demanded. Seven o'clock, Tuesday morning. All right, Churchill said, at the same time kicking a tattoo on the ribs of the snoring Antonson. You go back to Whitehorse, we'll go ahead and hold the Athenian. Antonson, stupid with sleep, not yet clothed in his waking mind, was bundled into the canoe and did not realize what had happened till he was drenched with the icy spray of a big sea and heard Churchill snarling at him through the darkness. Paddle, can't you? You want to be swamped? Daylight found them at Caribou Crossing. The wind dying down and Antonson too far gone to dip a paddle. Churchill grounded the canoe on a quiet beach where they slept. He took the precaution of twisting his arm under the weight of his head. Every few minutes, the pain of the pent circulation aroused him, whereupon he would look at his watch and twist the other arm under his head. At the end of two hours, he fought with Antonson to rouse him. Then they started. Lake Bennett, 30 miles in length, was like a mill pond, but halfway across, a gale from the south smote them and turned the water white. Hour after hour, they repeated the struggle on Tagish, over the side, pulling and shoving on the canoe up to their waists and necks and over their heads in the icy water. Toward the last, the good-natured giant played completely out. Churchill drove him mercilessly, but when he pitched forward and bade fair to drown in three feet of water, the other dragged him into the canoe. After that, Churchill fought on alone, 
arriving at the police post at the head of Bennett in the early afternoon. He tried to help Antonson out of the canoe, but failed. He listened to the exhausted man's heavy breathing and envied him when he thought of what he himself had yet to undergo. Antonson could lie there and sleep, but he, behind time, must go on over mighty Chilkoot and down to the sea. The real struggle lay before him, and he almost regretted the strength that resided in his frame because of the torment it could inflict upon that frame. Churchill pulled the canoe up on the beach, seized Bondell's grip, and started on a limping dog trot for the police post. There's a canoe down there, consigned to you from Dawson, he hurled at the officer who answered his knock. And there's a man in it pretty near dead. Nothing serious, only played out. Take care of him. I got a rush. Goodbye. Want to catch the Athenian. A mile portage connected Lake Bennett and Lake Linderman and his last words he flung back after him as he resumed the trot. It was a very painful trot, but he clenched his teeth and kept on, forgetting his pain most of the time in the fervent heat with which he regarded the grip sack. It was a severe handicap. He swung it from one hand to the other and back again. He tucked it under his arm. He threw one hand over the opposite shoulder and the bag bumped and pounded on his back as he ran along. He could scarcely hold it in his bruised and swollen fingers, and several times he dropped it. Once, in changing it from one hand to the other, it escaped his clutch and fell in front of him, tripped him up, and threw him violently to the ground. At the far end of the portage, he bought an old set of pack straps for a dollar, and in them he swung the grip. Also, he chartered a launch to run him the six miles to the upper end of Lake Linderman, where he arrived at four in the afternoon. The Athenian was to sail from Dai next morning at seven. Dai was 28 miles away, and between towered Chilkoot. He sat down to adjust his footgear for the long climb and woke up. He had dozed the instant he sat down, though he had not slept 30 seconds. He was afraid his next doze might be longer, so he finished fixing his footgear standing up. Even then, he was overpowered for a fleeting moment. He experienced the flash of unconsciousness, becoming aware of it in mid-air as his relaxed body was sinking to the ground, and as he caught himself together, he stiffened his muscles with a spasmodic wrench and escaped the fall. The sudden jerk back to consciousness left him sick and trembling. He beat his head with the heel of his hand, knocking wakefulness into the numbed brain. Jack Burns's pack train was starting back light for Crater Lake, and Churchill was invited to a mule. Burns wanted to put the grip sack on another animal, but Churchill held on to it, carrying it on his saddle pommel. But he dozed, and the grip persisted in dropping off the pommel, one side or the other, each time wakening him with a sickening start. Then, in the early darkness, Churchill's mule brushed him against a projecting branch that laid his cheek open. To cap it, the mule blundered off the trail and fell, throwing rider and grip sack out upon the rocks. After that, Churchill walked, or stumbled, rather, over the apology for a trail leading the mule. Stray and awful odors drifting from each side of the trail told of the horses that had died in the rush for gold. But he did not mind. He was too sleepy. By the time Long Lake was reached, however, he had recovered from his sleepiness, and at Deep Lake he resigned the grip sack to Burns. But thereafter, by the light of the dim stars, he kept his eyes on Burns. There were not going to be any accidents with that bag. At Crater Lake, the pack train went into camp, and Churchill, slinging the grip on his back, started the steep climb for the summit. For the first time, on that precipitous wall, he realized how tired he was. He crept and crawled like a crab, burdened by the weight of his limbs. A distinct and painful effort of will was required each time he lifted a foot. An hallucination came to him that he was shod with lead like a deep-sea diver, and it was all he could do to resist the desire to reach down and feel the lead. As for Bondell's grip sack, it was inconceivable that 40 pounds could weigh so much. It pressed him down like a mountain, 
and he looked back with unbelief to the year before, when he had climbed that same pass with 150 pounds on his back. If those loads had weighed 150 pounds, then Bondell's grip weighed 500. The first rise of the divide from Crater Lake was across a small glacier. Here was a well-defined trail, but above the glacier, which was also above Timberline, was naught but a chaos of naked rock and enormous boulders. There was no way of seeing the trail in the darkness, and he blundered on, paying thrice the ordinary exertion for all that he accomplished. He won the summit in the thick of howling wind and driving snow, providentially stumbling upon a small deserted tent into which he crawled. There he found and bolted some ancient fried potatoes and half a dozen raw eggs. When the snow ceased and the wind eased down, he began the almost impossible descent. There was no trail, and he stumbled and blundered, often finding himself, at the last moment, on the edge of rocky walls and steep slopes, the depths of which he had no way of judging. Partway down, the stars clouded over again, and in the consequent obscurity he slipped and rolled and slid for a hundred feet, landing bruised and bleeding on the bottom of a large, shallow hole. From all about him arose the stench of dead horses. The hole was handy to the trail, and the packers had made a practice of tumbling into it their broken and dying animals. The stench overpowered him, making him deadly sick, and as in a nightmare, he scrambled out. Halfway up, he recollected Bondell's gripsack. It had fallen into the hole with him. The pack strap had evidently broken, and he had forgotten it. Back he went, into the pestilential charnel pit, where he crawled around on hands and knees and groped for half an hour. Altogether, he encountered and counted seventeen dead horses, and one horse still alive that he shot with his revolver, before he found Bondell's grip. Looking back upon a life that had not been without valor and achievement, he unhesitatingly declared to himself that this return after the grip was the most heroic act he had ever performed. So heroic was it that he was twice on the verge of fainting before he crawled out of the hole. By the time he had descended to the scales, the steep pitch of Chilkoot was passed, and the way became easier. Not that it was an easy way, however, in the best of places, but it became a really possible trail, along which he could have made good time if he had not been worn out, and if he had had light with which to pick his steps, and if it had not been for Bondell's grip sack. To him, in his exhausted condition, it was the last straw. Having barely strength to carry himself along, the additional weight of the grip was sufficient to throw him nearly every time he tripped or stumbled. And when he escaped tripping, branches reached out in the darkness, hooked the grip between his shoulders, and held him back. His mind was made up that if he missed the Athenian, it would be the fault of the grip sack. In fact, only two things remained in his consciousness, Bondell's grip and the steamer. He knew only those two things, and they became identified in a way with some stern mission upon which he had journeyed and toiled for centuries. He walked and struggled on as in a dream, as part of the dream was his arrival at Sheep Camp. He stumbled into a saloon, slid his shoulders out of the straps, and started to deposit the grip at his feet but it slipped from his fingers and struck the floor with a heavy thud that was not unnoticed by two men who were just leaving. Churchill drank a glass of whiskey, told the barkeeper to call him in ten minutes, and sat down, his feet on the grip, his head on his knees. So badly did his misused body stiffen that when he was called it required another ten minutes and a second glass of whiskey to unbend his joints and limber up the muscles. Hey, not that way, the barkeeper shouted, and then went after him and started him through the darkness toward Canyon City. Some little husk of inner consciousness told Churchill that the direction was right, and still, as in a dream, he took the Canyon Trail. He did not know what warned him, but after what seemed several centuries of traveling, he sensed danger and drew his revolver. Still, in the dream, 
he saw two men step out and heard them halt him. His revolver went off four times, and he saw the flashes and heard the explosions of their revolvers. Also, he was aware that he had been hit in the thigh. He saw one man go down, and as the other came for him, he smashed him a straight blow with the heavy revolver full in the face. Then he turned and ran. He came from the dream shortly afterward to find himself plunging down the trail at a limping lope. His first thought was for the grip sack. It was still on his back. He was convinced that what had happened was a dream till he felt for his revolver and found it gone. Next, he became aware of a sharp stinging of his thigh, and after investigating, he found his hand warm with blood. It was a superficial wound, but it was incontestable. He became wider awake and kept up the lumbering run to Canyon City. He found a man with a team of horses and a wagon who got out of bed and harnessed up for $20. Churchill crawled in on the wagon bed and slept, the grip sack still on his back. It was a rough ride over water-washed boulders down the Dye Valley, but he roused only when the wagon hit the highest places. Any altitude his body above the wagon bed of less than a foot did not phase him. The last mile was smooth going, and he slept soundly. He came to in the gray dawn, the driver shaking him savagely and howling into his ear that the Athenian was gone. Churchill looked blankly at the deserted harbor. There's a smoke over at Skagway, the man said. Churchill's eyes were too swollen to see that far, but he said, It's she! Get me a boat! The driver was obliging and found a skiff and a man to row it for ten dollars, payment in advance. Churchill paid and was helped into the skiff. It was beyond him to get in by himself. It was six miles to Skagway, and he had a blissful thought of sleeping those six miles. But the man did not know how to row, and Churchill took the oars and toiled for a few more centuries. He never knew six longer and more excruciating miles. A snappy little breeze blew up the inlet and held him back. He had a gone feeling at the pit of his stomach and suffered from faintness and numbness. At his command, the man took the baler and threw salt water into his face. The Athenian's anchor was up and down when they came alongside, and Churchill was at the end of his last remnant of strength. Stop her! Stop her! He shouted hoarsely. Important message! Stop her! Then he dropped his chin on his chest and slept. When half a dozen men started to carry him up the gangplank, he awoke, reached for the grip, and clung to it like a drowning man. On deck, he became the center of horror and curiosity. The clothing in which he had left White Horse was represented by a few rags, and he was as frayed as his clothing. He had traveled for 55 hours at the top notch of endurance. He had slept six hours in that time, and he was 20 pounds lighter than when he had started. Face and hands and body were scratched and bruised, and he could barely see. He tried to stand up, but failed, sprawling out on the deck hanging on to the grip sack and delivering his message. Now, put me to bed, he finished. I'll eat when I wake up. They did him honor, carrying him down in his rags and dirt and depositing him in Bondell's grip in the bridal chamber, which was the biggest and most luxurious stateroom in the ship. Twice he slept the clock around, and he had bathed and shaved and eaten and was leaning over the rail smoking a cigar when the 200 pilgrims from White Horse came alongside. By the time the Athenian arrived in Seattle, Churchill had fully recuperated, and he went ashore with Bondell's grip in his hand. He felt proud of that grip. To him it stood for achievement and integrity and trust. I've delivered the goods, was the way he expressed these various high terms to himself, it was early in the evening, and he went straight to Bondell's home. Louis Bondell was glad to see him, shaking hands with both hands at the same time and dragging him into the house. Oh, thanks, old man. It was good of you to bring it out, Bondell said, 
when he received the grip sack. He tossed it carelessly upon a couch, and Churchill noted, with an appreciative eye, the rebound of its weight from the springs. Bondell was volleying him with questions. How did you make out? How are the boys? What became of Bill Smithers? Is Dell Bishop still with Pierce? Did he sell my dogs? How did Sulphur Bottom show up? You're looking fine. What steamer did you come out on? To all of which Churchill gave answer, till half an hour had gone by and the first lull in the conversation had arrived. Hadn't you better take a look at it? He suggested, nodding his head at the grip sack. Oh, it's all right, Bondell answered. Did Mitchell's dump turn out as much as he expected? I think you'd better look at it, Churchill insisted. When I deliver a thing, I want to be satisfied that it's all right. There's always a chance that somebody might have got into it when I was asleep or something. It's nothing important, old man, Bondell answered with a laugh. Nothing important, Churchill echoed in a faint, small voice. Then he spoke with decision. Louis, what's in that bag? I want to know. Louis looked at him curiously, then left the room and returned with a bunch of keys. He inserted his hand and drew out a heavy Colt's revolver. Next came out a few boxes of ammunition for the revolver and several boxes of Winchester cartridges. Churchill took the grip sack and looked into it. Then he turned it upside down and shook it gently. The gun's all rusted, Bondell said. Must have been out in the rain. Yes, Churchill answered. Too bad it got wet. I guess I was a bit careless. He got up and went outside. Ten minutes later, Louis Bondell went out and found him on the steps, sitting down, elbows on knees and chin on hands, gazing steadfastly out into the darkness. Mm -hmm.